Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends. Well, we head to Wistful Vista, 79 to be precise, and see what's going on in the household of Fibber McGee and Molly. And Fibber is going to go for a walk. And it's snowing. Y- you think Fibber's going to do that? We'll see. This episode originally broadcast December 4th, 1945. The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax products for home and industry present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn and Phil Leslie, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. Winter is a wonderful time of the year, if you care for that sort of thing. Some people like to stay home by the fire. Others like to go out and skate for hours on end. They don't even care which end. (laughs) And here at 79 Wistful Vista are two of our favorite winter sports, Fibber McGee and Molly. Don't get so close to the fireplace, dear. You'll fall in. <laughs> Think I ought to put on another log on? No, I don't. <laughs> You've got it so hot in here now, the doorknobs are turning brown. Yeah. Maybe it is a little warm at that. I'll open the window a second. Oh, get a load of that ooze on. Put that window down, please. Oh, boy, that air is wonderful out there. Well, leave it out there. <laughs> don't bring it in here. This is the kind of a night for a long walk, you know what? I'd like to get into my muck lux, wrap a muffler around my neck, and hike out to Dugan's Lake and back. Well, include me as the saying goes out. <laughs> I'm very happy right here uh, with my glass of root beer, my new murder mystery, and my pan full of popcorn, if you'll pardon the vulgar expression. <laughs> yeah, but you Yeah, listen. you hitch up the dog sled and carry the serum to Alaska. Mommy stays home. <laughs> Go on, mush. Yeah. <laughs> Chucks, we may not have another night like this all winter Clear, sharp, and beautiful Makes your blood tingle I can get the same effect by sitting on my foot for 20 minutes <laughs> Oh, gee whiz, I don't want to go alone I just thought You were maybe just you... bluffing, dearie, I know you You wouldn't stir away from this fireplace tonight If it was snowing $10 bills Oh, yeah? Well, I'll show you who's bluffing, Tootsie By George, I'm going to get into my coat And walk clear out to Dugan's Lake and back That's where I'm going to walk clear out to and back Your mittens are on the hall table Huh? Oh, oh, okay Well, here I go I'm going now Hello, Mrs. McGee, Mr. McGee Oh, hi, Alice Hello, Alice, Pretty dear Chris, You both look comfortable and happy sitting by this wonderful fire Well, himself here thinks it's very exhilarating weather, Alice He's even thinking of taking a long walk Out to Dugan's Lake and back, Alice Are you kidding, Mr. McGee? Why, it's colder than the keel of a kayak Bah, just a tang in the air, that's all <laughs> Look, what do you say we all go? We can throw snowballs on the way and build a snowman Ha, 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 ha Dive into snowdrifts Have fun, come on, let's go Have some popcorn, Alice? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you What are you reading, Mrs. McGee? Oh, it's a new crime club book, Alice The Man Who Asked Why Oh, oh it's wonderful I've read page 39 four times, thanks to my little lover of the great outdoors here. <laughs> okay, sissies, okay, I'll go alone then. You two panty waist can stay here and make like a couple of hothouse petunias. Oh, well, I couldn't go anyway, Mr. McGee. Bud's calling for me in half an hour. We're going to a movie. Oh, who's Bud, dear? Uh, Bud is the floor walker in my department at the Bonton, who always wears the carnation in his buttonhole's cousin. <laughs> <laughs> I see (laughs) Well You'll have to sit If you don't get started pretty soon Because all the theaters Are pretty crowded these days In the balcony (laughs) You and Bud will be Perfectly welcome To stay here by the fire, Alice There's plenty more popcorn And apples and marshmallows Oh, gee, thanks, Mrs. McGee Maybe I will ask Bud To stay here this evening We could sit by the fire And Oh, look at Mr. McGee 
<laughs> you look like you were going to the North Pole, Mr. McGee. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy yourself, dearie. Oh, I will, believe me. A few miles in this bracing air and I'll... I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll get it. <laughs> Where'll I take this overcoat off? You don't have to take your coat off to answer the phone. Well, maybe somebody wants me to stay home for something or other. <laughs> Hello? Who? Oh, yeah, yeah, she's right here. It's for you, Alice. Oh, thanks, Mr. McGee. Hello? Yes, this is Alice. What? No, that wasn't my father. That was the house that I rent a room in, Zoner. <laughs> yes. Well, look, bud, how about if we stay right here tonight? The fireplace is... What? Fine. Goodbye, bud. He says I talked him into it. <laughs> well, get going, McGee. Here's your coat and mittens. Huh? Oh, oh, well, okay. <laughs> well, so long. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, here I go. Hello, McGee. Anybody home? Oh, my gosh, old Doc Gamble. Come on in, Doc. Take off your things. Here, Molly, take my coat. I can't go out now. Yeah, we got company. Ah, oh, good old Doc. Come on right in, Doc. Set a spell, huh? Well, this has all been very nice, but I don't want to upset any of your plans. I see little Bucklewart here is all dressed up to go out. Ah, forget it, Doc. Stick around. I'm just going out for a little stroll is all. Nothing important. A little stroll? In this blizzard? Why, your ears would drop off before you got to the corner. Hmm? Not that that wouldn't be a facial improvement. Yeah. <laughs> he says he's going to walk out to Dugan's Lake and back, Doctor. Creepers, that's quite a hike. I rode out there once on the back of a fellow I knew at the airplane plant named Ozzy Simpson's motorcycle. <laughs> And was it ever rugged? Oh, you said it. Oh, sure. You're all making a lot of fuss about a little walk in the crisp winter air. I like winter walking. I feel marvelous with the wind in my face, head up, chest out, swinging my arms with the frosty stars twinkling down. Oh, stop it, you little double-malted extrovert. <laughs> well, you hate winter weather as much as I do. Any time I deliberately walk into a gale, it'll be Gail Patrick. <laughs> Where are you going, Alice? Oh, I've got to go up and fix my hair, Doctor. My boyfriend is coming over. Have a nice walk, Mr. McGee. Thanks, kid. I will. Take off your things, boys, and relax. I guess McGee's in for the night. Why, of course he is. Ain't a fit night out for man and a beast. Not that McGee could be classified as either one. <laughs> I never heard such a lot of silly nonsense about a little walk in the fresh air. Okay, go ahead, deep freeze. We'll give you a ten minutes start And then we'll send out the St. Bernard's <laughs> What a switch that is The dog's going to you Ah, uh, ta I can take it I got Indian blood in me I'm one sixteenth pot of water me You know, I think he really is, Doctor Betcha At least he dances much better alone Than he does with me <laughs> Well, if he's one sixteenth Indian, my mummy was an Egyptian. What does it prove, anyway? Well, it's just... That's for me. How do you know, Doctor? Any time the weather gets below zero and I'm chatting comfortably in a warm home with friends and the phone rings, it's for me. <laughs> Somebody's child has just swallowed a toy soldier and I've got to go and demobilize him. <laughs> well, what'd you expect? Did you take up medicine so he could sit in your big fat office all the... I'll get it. 79 Wistful Vista, Molly McGee speaking. Who? Yes, he's right here for you, Doctor. It is? Well, thank you. Gamble speaking. Yes. Well, yes, I... Uh, the bishop. Great Scott. Don't move him till I get there. Yeah, yes, I'll hurry. Hand me my coat and hat, McGee, quick. See you later, folks. Oh, my gosh, something serious, Doctor? Yes, when I left the hospital, I was in the middle of a chess game with one of the interns, and if he moves that bishop, I'm checkmated. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> cold out there. Well, better put your hat and coat away, dearie. I knew you wouldn't really go for a walk tonight. Oh, you did, did you? You think that big fat pill pusher talked me out of it, did you? No, sir. He just got my back up. That's just what he got up. Hand me my mittens again. Here. Hey, wait a minute. You don't think I ought to stay till Alice's boyfriend gets here? Oh, no, no, no. You run along, or I'll begin to suspect you of deliberately stalling. Why, Molly, how could you think such a thing? Much less say it. 
Why, I've been just waiting for a night like this with the lacy branches of the trees glittering with ice. Oh, with the clean, fresh air blowing through these mittens. I've got a hole in them, did you know it? <laughs> I'll mend them when you get back, sweetheart. Have a nice walk. Huh? Oh, oh, I sure will. Well, so long. Hello there, anybody home? Oh, well, uh, hi, Junior, come on in. Hey, Molly, here's Wilcox. <sighs> Cold out there. Ah, yeah. Say, I don't want to break up anything, Mac, if you were going out. Hello, Molly. Hello, Mr. Wilcox. Take off your coat and sit over here by the fire. You're not interfering with a thing, Junior. Mighty glad to see you. I was merely going out for a little walk. Out to Dugan's Lake and back. Dugan's Lake? Why, there are ten-foot snowdrifts between here and Dugan's Lake. They wouldn't find your body till spring. (laughs) (laughs) Why, it's a cold-out General Grant statue is flapping his arms. Oh, Please, Junior, you know I don't like to hear people exaggerate. (laughs) Anyway, cold weather don't frighten me. I was a fur trapper up north of Winnipeg for several years, you know that. And that's where they make the weather. I'll never forget one time. Here, let's let's take our coats off and be comfortable, Junior, huh? Okay. Yeah, that's it. I'll never forget the time I was running my trap line and I smacked into a blizzard 32 miles from my cabin. Gee, was it cold? Was it cold? Junior, it was so cold the teeth in my pocket comb were chattering. (laughs) <laughs> the smoke from my campfire froze solid before it got five feet in the air Just kind of congealed and fell over on the ground And that's what saved my life Tell us about it, McGee As if anybody could stop you <laughs> Well, sir, quick's a flash I piled Pete on the campfire Pete? Uh, that's a kind of an inflammable turf, isn't it? Yeah, but I was referring to Pete Umguck uh, An Eskimo that was working with me that season <laughs> I threw Pete on the fire because he was wearing a sheepskin coat that would make a big smoke, you see. Well, sir, fast as the smoke froze and fell down, I'd grab it and start piling it up. Do you ever handle any frozen smoke? (laughs) No, but we've heard a lot of hot air that was pretty solid. (laughs) Well, sir, frozen smoke is kind of like putty. Quite pleasant to work with. (laughs) And in 15 minutes, I'd build us a little igloo out of that frozen smoke that Pete and I lived in for 10 days. <laughs> and that darn near cost us our lives. Why, pal? Did you inhale part of the ceiling? <laughs> <laughs> no, but me and Pete was playing a game of Red Dog when the thaw come. And all of a sudden, there we was, strangling and gasping and coughing. <laughs> <laughs> that frozen smoke had melted and was choking us to death. Holding my breath, I grabs Pete and hauls him out into the open air. Then I rushes back into that cloud of smoke. Oh, dear. What on earth for, dearie? I'd left my cigarette burning. (laughs) Dangerous thing to do in the woods. Well, sir, that little experience taught me a valuable lesson, Junior. It did, eh? Yes, sir. From that day on, I never played another game of Red Dog with an Eskimo. (laughs) Well, uh, if you should trap a few seals on your way to Dugan's Lake tonight, dearie, Mother could use a nice new coat, you know. Hey, are you serious about taking a walk tonight, Mac? I've never been serious in my life, Junior. There's nothing better for the inside of a man than the outside of a house, I always say. Remember, all our famous men have been great walkers. Oh, I don't know, dearie. You know, uh, Christopher Columbus rode a boat, Paul Revere rode a horse, and Fred Allen rides Jack Benny. (laughs) Yes, and don't forget that for a while, walking met a great deal of opposition, too. What do you mean, opposition? Whom from? Housewives. Uh Oh, Oh, how do you like that? I ran into that with my big fat eyes wide open. (laughs) Why can't I ever... What I mean is housewives used to complain about people walking over their kitchen linoleum, tracking it up with mud and snow and rain. But that was before they discovered Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. You're not whistling Dixie, Mr. Wilcox. Yes, you know that housewives now, they know that spilled things and foot tracks can be so easily and quickly wiped off a Johnson glow-coated linoleum. Why, now they welcome the milkman on a muddy day. Yeah, they do if he's got any butter anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, they In might fact, be... you know, glow coat is one of the great labor-saving devices of the 20th century. No rubbing, no buffing. Just spread it around and let it dry. No fuss, no fume, no fret, no more popcorn. No. <laughs> now, McGee just ate the last handful, Mr. Wilcox. Can you wait till I pop some more? No, thank you. I've got to get along home. My wife promised me we were going to have Crab Louie for dinner tonight. Oh, well, trot along, Waxy. Don't keep him waiting. (laughs) Keep who waiting? This Crab Louie, whoever he is. Oh, okay, pal. Good night, Molly. Good night, Mr. Wilcox. (laughs) 
cold. And now for your information, dearie. Crab Louie is a kind of a salad. How do you know? You ever meet him? <laughs> Not a him, it's a dish made of crab meat. Oh, oh, I see. Did he invent it? Who? This guy, Louie. Louie who? Who well, search me? I never met him. He's a friend of Wilcox's. <laughs> We'll ask them to bring him over some night Sure, sure What do we care if he's a crab? <laughs> we'll jolly him up a bit Well, I suppose I better be making some more popcorn No, dearie, I'll make the popcorn You go on and take your walk That is, if you weren't just kidding about it all this time What do you mean, kidding? When I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it Come anything or high water <laughs> Where's my overshoes? Ah, oh, here they are Ah are you really going, McGee? Ah, you betcha. And save a little popcorn for me. I won't be gone more than three or four hours. Nothing like a brisk hike in the winter air to give a guy an appetite. Well, so long now. Goodbye, Pat. Oh, thank you, Mr. McGee. I was just about to ring the doorbell. Oh, well, look who's here. Hi, Karsty. I'm glad to see you. Come in, come in, come in. Hey, Molly, look who's here. It's old lady, er, it's Mrs. Carstairs. Ah, uh, do come in, Mrs. Carstairs. <laughs> Shut that door, McGee, from either side. <laughs> Arsty, you'll never know how glad I am to see you. Shake hands and pardon my mittens. Uh, thank you, Mr. McGee. Goodness, that fire feels good, Mrs. McGee. If I may quote my husband, I'm colder than a well digger's memories. <laughs> but, uh, am I detaining you, Mr. McGee? I see you're dressed to go out. Oh, no, nothing important, Carsty. Just going out for a little stroll. Yes, out to Dugan's Lake and back. Really? At 12 below zero? If you have a grudge against your insurance company, Mr. McGee, wouldn't it be simpler just to stand up in the bathtub and stick your wet finger into a light socket? <laughs> I guess you underestimate me as an outdoors man, Karsty. Did you know I was a fur trapper for several years up in the Saskatchewan country? Oh, dear. I'll never forget. One day I got caught in a terrific blizzard 32 miles from my cabin. Good heavens, Mr. McGee. Was it cold? Was it cold? My cow gave ice cream for two weeks. <laughs> Amazing. Yes, it seems another po impossibility. <laughs> anyway, Carsty, here I was, caught in this terrific blizzard. Even the smoke from my campfire froze before it got five feet into the air, just kind of congealed and fell to the ground. And that's what saved my life. Because quick's a flash, I piled peat on the fire, and when I got him going, good. December 4th, 1945, Fibber, McGee, and Molly on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, December 4th, 1945, Fibber, McGee, and Molly. And that little experience taught me a valuable lesson, Karsty. Did it indeed, Mr. McGee? Yes, sir. From that day on, I never played Red Dog with an Eskimo. Wasn't that an interesting experience, Mrs. Carstairs? It really was, my dear. And while it might seem incredible to some, I happen to know it's true. <laughs> you do? Yes. You see, Mr. Carstairs and I were motoring through Maine one winter en route to our hunting lodge. Oh. My husband goes up there every year to moot shoes, uh, shoot moose. <laughs> and what happened, Mrs. Carstairs? We had a blowout just as we encountered a blizzard. But my husband leaped out of the car, lit a cigar, and started blowing smoke rings, which froze almost instantly, of course. Oh, well, Nat. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, he blew one the exact size of our tires, mounted it on the rim, and we reached our hunting lodge in the nick of time. <laughs> What did you do when it melted, Millicent? Oh, we're still using it, my dear. <laughs> yes, it's quite amusing how that tire has baffled our ration board. <laughs> and do you know, every cold winter day since that time, my husband has smoked rough-cut tobacco. What for, Karsty? He's trying to blow a smoke ring with a tread on it. <laughs> Well, this has all been very entertaining, but I simply must go. Good evening. Good night, Mrs. Carstairs. Good night, Millicent. Did you ever hear such a line of malarkey in all your born days? <laughs> Who does she think she's kidding with that smoke ring stuff? <laughs> Frozen smoke rings. 
Why, that's impossible. <laughs> you know how some people exaggerate, dearie. Yeah. And you better get out of that overcoat. It's too late to go for a walk now. Too late for who? I ain't afraid of the dark. I said I was going to walk to Dugan's Lake and back and by, George, I'm going to do it. And right now, too. Where's my mittens? Oh, here they are. Well, so long. Bless his brave little heart. He hates walking like a jockey and snow like the Miami Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> But he'll trudge out to Dugan's Lake like a little man. Hey, Molly, look who I found coming up our front walk. Old civic virtue himself. He's never going to make it to the lake. December 4th, 1945, Fibber McGee and Molly. The conclusion follows these words. You're listening to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of Fibber McGee and Molly, December 4th, 1946. Somebody else enters the game. Come on in, Latrivia, old man, come on in. <laughs> uh, quit shoving me, McGee. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mrs. McGee, though it certainly is a bit of cold one. Yeah, it's cold, but it's stimulating, boy. <sighs> I... I don't suppose you'd have a small glass of something to... My uh... goodness, what's the matter with me? McGee, get his honor a nice cold glass of root beer. Why, sure. I'll... No, 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 no. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, anyway. I, uh, come to think of it, if I took any liquids, I'd clink all the way home. <laughs> As I was saying to our street commissioner this morning, Bunderson, I said, this is the coldest... Incidentally, day. Latrivia, yeah. how much does he get a year? Who, the street commissioner? Ah, well, you're a taxpayer, so I suppose you're entitled to the information. His salary is 7500 per annum. How much is that a year? <laughs> per annum means per year, McGee. Oh, well, is that in addition to his commissions, Latrivia? What commission? Any commission. He's a commissioner, isn't he? Yes, but he, uh, he doesn't work on commission. He gets a straight salary. Well, then why do they call him a commissioner? Because he belongs to the street commission, you idiot. Oh, he belongs to the commission, but the commissions don't belong to him, huh? Is that your idea of fair play, Latrivia? Guy works all year long earning commissions, and the city says, no, you take your straight salary and like it. By George, I'm going to start an investigation, Latrivia, that'll start... You go right ahead, McGee. I've been investigated by bigger dunderheads than you in my day, and if I... Now, can now, now, a... there's no use flying into a rage, Mr. Mayor. No. I assure you the investigation will be fair and impartial. Certainly. All we want is a square deal for our public servants. Of course, but man then he earns a commission. He's entitled to get a commission. But he doesn't plus get... his salary. But he's not entitled to a commissary, uh, uh, to a commission. As a murder, as a member of the common council, a council. <laughs> what I mean to say is that the street. He's a. We all in the. Uh, that is the. the <laughs> uh, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> McGee. <laughs> hey? Will you do me a favor? Why, of course he will, Mr. Mayor. Just name it, Latrivia. Well, when you get to Dugan's Lake, will you walk out to the exact middle of it and jump up and down? Hard! <laughs> now, there goes a very thoughtless guy. <laughs> I don't suppose he ever stopped to think what might happen if I jumped up and down on the ice on Dugan's Lake. <laughs> it's pretty thin out there in the middle. <laughs> Fella could bust right through. Oh, well, he didn't know what he was saying, most likely. No. Look, dearie, if you're not going to Dugan's Lake, and I wouldn't blame you if you didn't... What do you mean, if I'm not going? Certainly I'm going, and right away, too. I got my back up about this thing by George. I'll hate myself in the morning if I don't go through with it now. So long, baby. Wait a minute. Here's your mittens. Huh? Oh. Oh, thanks. Well, so long. Enjoy yourself, darling. Okay. Heavenly days. I do believe he's really going. Well, now, where was I? Oh, yes. Page 39. The alley where the dead man had been found was a blind areaway between a building... Hey, Molly, I'm home, safe and sound. What time is it? Oh, hello, dearie. Uh, it's just 10.30. You've only been gone three hours. Did you enjoy your walk? Oh, it was marvelous. I'm pretty tired, but it was worth it. 
Did you ever see the moonlight on Lake Dugan in wintertime? Oh. I'm telling you, it's a spectacle. The stillness, the blue shadows of the trees on the dunes, oh. the swoop of a night owl over the drifted snow. Ah, oh, by George Marley, it's an experience that I'll never forget. I'll get it, McGee. You must be completely worn out. Sit down and rest, sweet. Ah. 79 Wistful Vista, Molly McGee speaking. Yeah. Who? Oh, he did? Ah, oh, well, thank you very much, I'm sure. Goodbye. <laughs> it was Kramer's Drugstore, McGee. Kramer's Drugstore? What'd they want? They said to tell you you left your mittens on the pinball machine. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one of America's favorite comedians comes back to the NBC airwaves tonight. You'll hear him on his new show over most of these stations directly following Bob Hope. Yes, and we know you join us in wishing good luck and even greater success to Red Skelton. Red has spent two years in the Army, folks, doing a grand job of entertaining our men here on the high seas and in Europe. Red is one of the fortunate GIs who has an assured future. But there are thousands and thousands of men who will for many years be dependent on you and us for hospital care, for rehabilitation and return to civil life. And there's a debt of honor we owe the families of those who lost their lives in our service. The only way we can really pay these obligations is by our purchases of victory bonds, a profitable security for you and a much needed loan to our country. Remember, it's strictly GI, government issue, a grand investment, and gratitude implied. Good night. Good night, all. This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax Products for Home and Industry, inviting you all to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. A lot of people forget Red Skelton did serve his country. December 4th, 1945, Fibber McGee and Molly here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the children's Christmas serial, The Cinnamon Bear. But I guess we can listen, too. This originally broadcast December 4th, 1937. Well, we left Judy and Jimmy and their friends in a pretty tight spot last time. You probably remember how Mr. Presto, the correspondence school magician, made several passes at his big silk hat and conjured up Penelope the Pelican, who had made off with the Silver Star. Unfortunately, however, when Mr. Presto exerted his magic power to pull Penelope back, he did it so violently that she dropped the star on the island of Obi. Then, to crown their misfortunes, they were about to open an interesting-looking chest, which they found on the beach, when all of a sudden they were surrounded by pirates. And I must say, they looked most ferocious. Oh, Jimmy, I'm so scared. What do you suppose these pirates will do to us? Willikers, I don't know, Judy. Gee, we didn't even touch their chest. What right have you pirates to molest us? We have them minding our own business. <laughs> hey, you'll find out soon enough, won't he, mateys? Eh? <laughs> hey, we can't take this dragon. He's too big for the rowboat. Maybe he'll be able to rescue us like he did before. I sure hope so. Hey, you two children and the bear, you follow us. Where do you want to take us? Wouldn't you like to know? I sure <laughs> would, all right. And what's more, you can't take Judy and Patty O'Cinnamon on me if you don't tell us. Well, well, well. Now, what would you do, huh? Well, why should I tell you if you won't tell me where you're taking us? Say, <laughs> <laughs> he'd make a good pirate, wouldn't he, matey? <laughs> Well, my little landlubber, I'll tell you. We're taking you with us on board our ship. Me too? Oh, definitely you. Well, why me? Well, you're all far too curious for your own good. You'll know in good time. If you don't need me, I have a very pressing engagement. Oh, you can go whenever you like. The sooner the better. Scat! In spite of your undignified rejoinder, I, I take my leave. Goodbye, crazy quilt dragon. Goodbye. Good. Goodbye, crazy quilt old pal. Goodbye, my friend. Just wait until I find a few barrels of corks. Uh, goodbye. Well, all ready? Forward. One-eyed Joe and Black Ben, take the treasure chest. All right, Ben. Barnaby Bright, 
You and Cox and Charlie stand by to shove off the boat. Aye, aye. And the rest of you assist our friends into the boat. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> like the way they're laughing at all. It does have a very unpleasant ring to my ears. Jimmy, take my hand. All right. I won't let them hurt you, Judy, no matter what. Are we all ready? Aye, aye, aye. Then let's go, all hands to the oars. Aye, aye. Shove off. Aye, aye. Yeah, we're off. Heave home, my hearties, to the ship. Heave. Ho! Heave. Ho! Heave. Ho! Heave. I sight the ship, mate. Ahoy, the Susie Q! Ahoy, below! What are your report? Treasure and captives! <laughs> oh, Jimmy, now we're captives again. I hope they won't treat us like those old Incaboos. Oh, I don't think so, Judy. After all, those Incaboos were just blotter people. And these pirates are folks just like us. And maybe they won't want to make pirates out of us. Excuse me. I never could be a sailor, much less a pirate. These ocean waves are very hard on my stuffing. Ahoy above! Ahoy below! Throw us a rope! Aye, aye! Let down the gangplank. We have a lady with us. A lady! Oh, oh no, I'm not a lady. I'm just a little girl. Madam, you may be just a little girl at home. But with pirates, <laughs> you're a lady. May I offer you an arm? No, thank you, Mr. Pirate. If I have to go, I want Jimmy to go with me. We're twins. As you wish, madam. Up you go. And now the bear. All right, hoist the longboat. Aye, aye. And now... Where may we conduct our captives to Captain Taffy? He's on the bridge, mate. Thanks. This way, please. Oh, dear. Gee whiz. This sure is a big ship, all right. What did he call it? I believe he called it the Susie Q. And now I bring you before our jolly captain. Captain, our prisoners. <laughs> Welcome to our pirate ship. Now, just a minute. Judy's my twin sister, and I got to take care of her. And if you're going to make us walk the plank and everything, you better look out all right. Well, who said anything about walking planks? Aren't you pirates? And don't pirates make people walk planks? <laughs> Only old-fashioned pirates. Bosun, pipe the chest before us. Aye, aye. Open her up. Gee, toffee and caramel. Chocolate creams. Oh, my goodness. Cinnamon sticks, my favorite brand. You see, we're a new kind of pirate. What do you mean by that? We'll tell you all about ourselves in our song. Barnaby Bright, strike up our chanting. Aye, aye, sir. <laughs> Oh, 
Candy ho, the candy clue, the star book. Sing yo ho ho and a bottle. Ha ha. Isn't it marvelous, Jimmy? Yeah, oh, it my sure is. goodness, what a relief. Bless my stuffing. I've lived in and around the island of maybe for some time, but I never, never heard of candy pirates. Well, we don't touch the mainland much, my friend. We mostly keep to the islands. Islands? Did you ever sail near the island of Obi? Often. In fact, quite often. Yes, it's one of our favorite anchorages. Uh, do you think you might be going there uh, pretty soon? Well, that depends. Well, we might just as well head in that direction as any. Uh, have you some special reason in mind? We certainly have, Captain. Our silver star is on there. Silver star? Oh, yes. You see, it belongs on our Christmas tree. Oh. Well, the candy pirates would be most happy to aid you in your search for the silver star. We'll hoist anchor and sail for the island immediately. That'll be fine. Do you think it'll take long? No, not very. How long does it generally take, pilot? Well, depends on the wind, Captain. It's pretty good today. Oh, not more than an hour or so. Good. Bolson, pipe up the anchor. Aye, aye, sir. Where's the jib? Up with the topsail. Uh, Pilot, take the helm and head for the island of Obi. Aye, aye, sir. And now, my friends, a visit with the candy pirates would not be complete without a little hospitality. What's that? Something to eat? <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, what would you say to a little refreshment? Gee, I'd like that and something to eat besides. <laughs> um, uh, do you happen to have any cinnamon <laughs> buns? I haven't eaten any in some time, and I feel quite unferocious. Why, yes, my friend. It so happens that the cook made cinnamon buns only this morning. Hooray! And in my cabin, I have some very, very superior chocolate fudge. Let's hear no more. Lead on, Captain. Candy ho, candy ho, the candy to the starboard. Sing your ho ho and a bottle of pop. Candy ho, candy ho, the candy to the starboard. Sing your ho ho. Captain, but land has been sighted. It has? Well, give me the glass. Is that the island of Obi? Yes. Do you want to take a look through the telescope? Willikers, it's just like the one we looked through to degrow. So it is. Jimmy, look. Isn't that a policeman standing with his back to the ocean? Well, let's see. Well, yes, yeah, sure it is. He looks like one of those roly-poly dolls. <laughs> Judy, look at him waving his stick. He's turning around. What's that bright thing he's wearing on his coat? Why, my goodness, it's our silver star. Well, at least our friends are on the trail of their silver star again, and let's hope that Captain Taffy and the Candy Pirates can get them ashore in time to overtake the roly-poly policeman. It'll be interesting to find out how he happened to get it, and especially if Judy and Jimmy will succeed in getting it back. But we'll have to wait till next time for that.
December 4th, 1937, The Cinnamon Bear, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. A full restored set of The Cinnamon Bears available to you if you go to see it, visit my friend Ted at RadioMemories.com. He supplies shows on cassette, CD, or flash drive for your computer, and he's also beautifully restored Lum and Abner. I've been listening to him, and there's not a dog in the bunch. They're all good. Uh... Visit Ted, radiomemories.com. That's radiomemories.com. Great restoration work on great classic radio programs. Also, visit my website, classicradio.stream. You can stream our shows on demand. Learn more about classic radio collecting. You can contact me there. You can find our social media links. And you can also buy me a coffee like Larry did. Uh, The buy me a coffee money does not supply me with coffee. Dr. Pepper in the morning and uh, lots of uh, coconut water and water uh, in the evenings. Uh, But no, what that Buy Me a Coffee money does is helps us not only acquire additional classic radio collections, but it also helps us ensure that our distribution channels remain open. That's at classicradio.stream. And we thank you for tuning in. Thank this station. Support their advertisers. Tell your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.